In the future, we may be able to claim new worlds and forge them into paradises, but should we? The survey ship Hydra and its pilot and captain, Branton Jacobs, landed on HD 18445A's third planet almost a month ahead of schedule, and their first month there proved very exciting indeed. It was a mineral rich world with geology suggesting very stable solar output and geological cycles. The planet gave every sign of being one of those planets surveyors dream of, the kind with everything colonists could want in terms of an easy target for terraforming. The day was even 24 hours and 12 minutes long. Their commission for surveying this planet was going to be huge, because even a tiny percentage of a planet is still incomprehensible wealth. There was just one minor anomaly in the area, where there were some lakes heavy on geysers and rich in phosphorus, way up in the frozen tundra. When they got there they realized why the rest of the planet was so dead, life if it had originated here couldn't have spread out to the icy plains beyond. But as they went toward the shore of the nearest lake to take some samples, a mini-legged centipede-like creature came out on the shore. Brant and Jacob stared at each other in chagrin through their helmets, then, slowly, deliberately, Jacobs crushed the alien critter under his boot. It will have to go, Captain Jacob said. Looking at the steaming primordial lakes on the icy tundra and thinking about the two centuries on ice it had taken them to reach this planet, their big score, Brant nodded. It was a pity but life is rough, and there were so many handy metal-rich asteroids in this system, another plus for the colonists, and it wouldn't be so strange for one to happen to fall on this spot. On the off chance anything survived, the scientists would have fun trying to figure out how the impact caused life to form there. Brant would run the calculations for an asteroid trajectory bump when they got back into orbit. Welcome to another episode of Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, and I am your aforementioned host, Isaac Arthur. For a little under 10 years now and just starting my second year as President of the National Space Society, so I'm guessing there's not a lot of suspense on this episode as to whether or not I tend to think terraforming planets is a reasonably ethical thing to do. That said, it is not cut and dry across the board, and so today we will examine not just why many feel terraforming is generally a good idea, but also the concerns a lot of us have about it too, and some of the less well-known problems we could have confronting us while we go around colonizing the galaxy. And we may as well start with the word colonizing which often has some bad connotations historically and is the main root of the concern with terraforming. It gives us our two main cases as well as our first in-between cases for contemplation. I have encountered some folks who will generally think it is wrong for us to seek to take an entirely lifeless rock of a planet or moon and try to turn it into a new settlement for humanity or alter its non-existent ecosystem. So too, I have met folks who didn't think there'd be anything wrong with showing up on some planet that already had intelligent aliens on it and absorbing them into our civilization, or even sometimes killing them off for fear there'd be no room for both of us in the galaxy. Neither viewpoint seems to be anything approaching common, let alone a majority view, and in general I assume anyone taking either perspective online usually tends to have a hint of someone not being serious or acting the troll. Nonetheless, I'm pretty content to bypass any serious contemplation that it's ethically wrong for us to tamper with the pristine surface of the moon, or alternatively, that it is okay to just obliterate any native civilization we encounter out among the stars. There is more gray area once we get into pre-existing ecologies, and this mostly because if you found 10,000 planets covered in various print of algae and nothing else, you've probably got doubts about the scientific and economic value of further study. As we discussed in our recent episode on quarantining planets, the ability to quarantine on such a world for a couple billion years till intelligence evolves is pretty improbable too. But practical doesn't mean ethical, and it is our good first step to ask when it is okay to terraform a planet with pre-existing life on it and if it matters how advanced it is, or if it should matter if we thought it likely have advanced life in the future or not. Twinned with that is the question of how sure we need to be that a planet is lifeless before it is okay to terraform it. But these are the beginning questions we need to ponder because while we might be willing to wave away whether it can be unethical to terraform a planet with no life on it, we also have to ask ourselves if it is okay to do it once we started settling it. Short form, if my great-grandfather founded a now robust settlement in some crater on Mars, 
and folks start talking about dumping an ocean worth of water on the Red Planet, that settlement is going to get flooded. So too, if I've built a beautifully floating homestead among the clouds of Venus and folks decide to start deploying an L1 solar shade to cool the planet and remove that thick atmosphere like we discussed in Winter on Venus, do I have any say or is this just a matter of majority rule? And the current majority or the folks a thousand years ago who founded the first settlements on the planet dreaming it would be another Earth, and which fifty generations had worked toward. Maybe the planet got to half normal Earth air pressure and composition and a lot of folks accepted genetic engineering or bionics to let them breathe that and now no longer want the world to get any more Earth-like than it is. I am guessing that if you're watching this episode you already know what terraforming is, but the key word there is Earth-like. It is the process or processes used to make some planet more like Earth and has two noteworthy variants. The first is para-terraforming, which has a hazy border with normal terraforming but tends to imply more artificial constructs that need maintenance, like domes covering the Martian surface to keep air and heat in, or some collection of space stations at the L1 Lagrange point to alter the amount and type of light coming in or deflect solar wind in place of a magnetosphere. The other option is bioforming, which is where we alter people and organisms to fit a new planet rather than the other way around. The extreme version would be you growing gills and becoming a merman on an ocean planet. We have tons of episodes getting into the many different methods and processes for all three, terraforming, paraterraforming, and bioforming, but the recurring point I tend to make on the matter isn't which is better but rather that in most cases you will always end up using a bit of all three, and moreover, the particular ratio of them and which varieties of them that you use will likely change with time as your colony grows. What's more, it isn't likely that people will have uniform opinions on that matter in different regions and periods. Planets are huge and we have no reason to assume anything like homogeneity of people and purpose on them any more than Earth has. Everybody is going to have different goals and priorities that also shift over time. So too, a given culture might be way more okay with one type of change than another. We could imagine a civilization whose mythology leaned heavy on some villainous and ugly sea monster and those people having a very different attitude on becoming mermen and mermaids than some culture where the Little Mermaid was a classic and that same group of folks might get very different attitudes about having a modification to a thicker skin that could handle radiation and lower pressure better, or might be okay with something soft and glossy but reject something more akin in texture to tree bulk. Terraforming isn't likely to be the same in many cases because there's always going to be some disagreement about what's okay and what is not, and also what adds unique character to their world. As an example, I think most of us would consider two moons in the sky a very neat feature for a new planet to have and would not expect anyone to suggest they need to take one of those moons apart and adjust the other to a lunar month of 29 and a half days. For all we know it might be very hard for the terrestrial ecosystem to adapt to a 22 hour day or a 26 day lunar month or a second set of tides. Both the month and tides are very baked into our biology and you might see an argument over whether or not they should adjust the moon and remove the other or genetically tweak a million species to function on a new month, or new day length of 31 hours or 19. And if one of your settlements already made that modification, they will likely be very resistant to paying taxes to fund that massive terraforming effort to change day length or year length. Like the folks living in the deep crater being told you'd like to put an ocean there, they will likely feel a bit unenthusiastic about the matter and maybe they are only 10% of your population, but maybe that's not a 51% voted for it and so it's okay type of issue. I should also note that terraforming is very destructive. I think folks imagine some rocky desert terrain suddenly sprouting grass and trees. However, there is no roots preventing erosion and mudslides, and a planet you are terraforming is likely to look at least as overhauled as if some glaciers pass through and more like if someone decided to redecorate the area with jackhammers and H-bombs. Indeed as we've discussed before, nuking a planet is one of the realistic strategies for expedited terraforming. If you settle the planet and decide to initiate a big terraforming project, you might seriously consider evacuating it while you did the bigger lifting, like making it rain non-stop for several centuries to put an ocean on there while you dropped comets on it. 
What do we do about the folks who refuse to move when we tell them their hab dome is on a stretch of landscape likely to slide down in a muddy avalanche once we get to terraforming? What if that crater hab we mentioned simply refuses? Can we make them move? Can we make them reinforce the dome to handle being under a kilometer of water? And of course we can't say, this may be an episode on the ethics of terraforming, but I have no special moral authority or insight as to when it's okay to make someone move or modify their hab dome for the nominal greater good of turning that planet blue and green, any more than I can say it is or isn't right to find a planet with some primordial goo on it that hasn't even gone multicellular yet and terraform the planet anyway. Neither really strikes me as an easy black and white issue the way choosing to settle an entirely lifeless rock would be, or alternatively, murdering off some indigenous alien civilization whose only crime was to be on some rock we wanted for our own. For the very simple Alge life case, many would say that once we've gotten comprehensive samples from all over the planet, we could keep a digital archive of the genetics, we could print DNA and probably any alien equivalent, and then just keep some preserves. As I've noted in some other episodes though, you're often safer building your nature preserves off-planet in nicely isolated space habitats, as they tend to be easier to keep invasive species, poachers, and other unexpected problems out of. But the flip side of that, and to terraforming, is not to bother turning plants into Earth-like ones, but instead to build vast artificial megastructures we can build ecologies and civilizations inside by default rotating cylinder habitats like the O'Neill Cylinder. These allow way more living space than planets do kilogram for kilogram, and on an order of around a million to one. You can deconstruct Earth to make rotating habitats and you'd have many quadrillions of them with a combined living area of millions of continents, and thousands of those could be devoted to various indigenous or terrestrial nature preserves without making a dent in that economy and vastly larger in scope than the planet you came to. More importantly, you don't need to disassemble that planet or life-bearing moon, you can use local asteroids or truly dead worlds, or even suck heavy matter right out of stars, which depending on its metallicity probably has hundreds to thousands of planets with the materials inside it. Incidentally, we would not usually refer to space habitats as examples of para-terraforming but mostly because the entire topic focuses on making existing rocks livable. Conceptually they overlap with para-terraforming or could be their own distinct category. The original use of the word terraforming from Jack Williamson's short story Collision Orbit features a modest asteroid with a gravity generator on it to hold air in and let people walk around its small surface and that's the first example of terraforming as, again, the term was coined in that story and about that rock. Thus that example presumably must count as terraforming rather than para-terraforming. Hence, I personally would consider cramming a rotating habitat into an asteroid as an example of para-terraforming, but we'd loosely draw the line between it and terraforming in that it takes regular intelligent maintenance to keep the environment Earth-like. Our environment takes maintenance too, but it is principally provided by non-intelligent actors evolved on the planet. Everything from geological cycles to food chains is involved in this planet's state, which changes too, but requires no active human effort, or at least didn't used to. I would argue Earth is no longer a natural ecosystem in its current state, and if we disappear tomorrow, its eventual reversion to a natural state would be very unlike where it was when humanity was less impactful. We discuss that more in our episode Earth After Humanity. And we need to understand that a planet left to itself might un-terraform itself. In the case of para-terraforming, probably faster, but I could imagine us constructing diamond-hard domes that were still around and letting sunlight in for a million years, and which covered all the land and even sea, which might only be small lakes and ponds anyway. At some point the natural effects of asteroids crashing or volcanoes erupting ought to start breaking some domes and letting others be covered by dust outside them, blown around by the air leaking out of those domes and covering them over. Of course you might engineer some organisms, or self-replicating machines, whose job was to clean them off. This contributes to what probably is the biggest contention on preserving native ecologies, Nature isn't static and preserving it over millions of years is not natural. If that's what you're doing that might be fine, but you are effectively intervening heavily to keep a planetary ecology static like that. So too, if you're just trying to leave it alone, as an experiment, 
you probably run out of useful new knowledge to gather at some point, especially as it's a continuous effort that's expensive in time and resources, and lost opportunity cost. Alternatively, if you're leaving it alone because you don't want to interfere in nature, many folks would argue you are taking the random processes of Darwinian evolution and putting them on a pedestal, which many folks do nowadays and which they may do in the future, but it's easy to see a conflict arising between factions and a system over that. On the one hand, we would figure that with so much construction material available in a solar system then that native world could be spared, and certainly early on while it also needs careful study to unlock its secrets. Study could also be done in additional space habitats you built to simulate that native world too, and doubtless you would conduct exactly those experiments to see what the interactions were between that life and terrestrial organisms, there is no shortage of raw materials early on. However, I think that after many thousands of years of harvesting other raw materials, and even your sun itself, people are likely to feel that planet could be used more effectively. I think a lot of us could see saying look, we've learned all we can about these alien microorganisms this last 10,000 years, and we have more and more infractions of people getting in there, we even had to nuke one spot to eliminate contamination. This is a losing game, costing more every day, let's terraform that planet already. And they might start cutting down on quarantine funding and enforcement to make it easier for an accident to occur and slip in some terrestrial biology. I think you have these sorts of disagreements at every level of terraforming too, transforming into the main political football on most new worlds, and systems in general, for at least many centuries if not millennia. Let's consider another scenario as food for thought. On the planet of dusk the sun never rises or sets except in a thin band of twilight, it orbits a red dwarf once a month, which it is tightly locked to and on which the desert side is forever baked by that enormous but dim star overhead, while on the back it is eternal night. As usual for settlement, scientific teams landed first to explore and survey while the orbital infrastructure was prepared. It's a big planet with 20% more surface area than Earth, though only a fractionally higher surface gravity, and possesses a weak atmosphere about 50% of Earth's own, with nitrogen abundant, carbon dioxide common, and trace amounts of methane and ammonia. It was a few years into study before they found any life forms, and this was after survey crews had begun getting lazy about containment, and it was just bacteria anyway. Thus they never had to consider whether to establish themselves there, indeed many people think one or more of the survey crews intentionally snuck in photosynthetic bacteria to ensure there was no way the planet wouldn't get contaminated. It is, after all, easy to sterilize the outside of suits and they have all sorts of leak monitors. But dusk surprised them twice more. First, it turned out there was a lot of life on the dark side, far under the ice in many thermally heated and volcanically fueled subsurface lakes, and multicellular life at that, including something akin to a small protofish and proto-crab. And second, that the local organisms seemed to have a knack for genetic theft as photosynthetic native organisms began popping up on the twilight belt. Some also suspect that other scientists might have engineered these to ensure it would be more likely that terraforming would proceed with more respect to the native life. The terraforming plan was to crunch some asteroids up to make some mirrors and lenses and have many statites at the L1 that would rotate over a 24 hour period to provide a night cycle, while mirrors around the solar L2 behind the planet would bounce light back down on the world's dark side to give it a day cycle. We now have four major factions in play, the Nightbringers, who feel the planet should still have the solar shades deployed to L1 to give the uninhabited day side a night and some cooler temperatures. Then we have the Daybringers, who still want the L2 shade as well even though it will melt the ice above all those subsurface dark side lakes. We also have the Retreat, who feel dusk should be abandoned entirely and that the war archives should be opened to let them prepare nanotech and bioweapons targeted to kill off any terrestrial life on the planet before self-destructing. Life will be lived in space, by humans, and the planet left to that native ecology. Finally we have the Bandors, who want to limit human habitation to the Twilight Band for now and aim for an eventual synthetically mixed Terran and Duskian ecology. None of them fall into a category of wiping out the native dusk life entirely, 
all four factions agree that samples of native life must be vigorously sought out and have their genetics digitally stored and nature preserves created on planet and in orbit as more rotating habitats get built. Even at the most optimistic estimates, organisms on dusk are not terribly varied or complex by Earth's standards so it won't take much to store it. So which camp do you think is most right, or maybe least wrong? And who, if anyone, are the villains of the piece? The Daybringers, the Nightbringers, the Retreat, or the Bandors? Are they missing something? So, what are our major conundrums for contemplation? Well, probably more than we could list off, but here are the major ones I hear come up, and of course your mileage may vary, and some were addressed during the episode, though you be the judge of if it was addressed satisfactorily or not. Environmental Impact and Responsibility The process of terraforming could have irreversible impacts on the existing environment of a planet. Again, even mild terraforming is likely to rearrange the landscape, not simply spray paint it blue and green. It will also have phases of growing complexity that will move it more Earth-like and might entail intentional mass extinctions as we advance that complexity. It raises questions about our responsibility towards extraterrestrial ecosystems, even if they are initially barren or uninhabitable by Earth's standards. Interference with potential life forms There's a possibility, however remote, of existing or dormant life forms on other planets. Planets are huge and we have no idea what nooks and crevices they might be able to hide life in, certainly Earth has offered us many surprising examples already. Terraforming could disrupt or destroy these life forms. The ethical implications of potentially harming alien life through accident or negligence are significant. Resource Exploitation and Sustainability Terraforming would likely require massive amounts of resources, especially for cases such as comet bombardment to create oceans. This raises concerns about sustainability and the ethics of depleting a star system's resources for such a project, particularly in contrast to artificial space habitats like O'Neill cylinders or even post-biological civilizations running on starlight. Human Safety and Health The health and safety of humans involved in terraforming projects are also ethical concerns. This includes both the pioneers who initiated the process and potential future inhabitants. Terraforming might be physically dangerous, but it could also be ruinously stressful as a project of centuries at a minimum. We may be in awe of the efforts needed to build mighty structures like the pyramids or the cathedrals, which often took many lifetimes, but we should not ignore the human cost those construction projects likely had on many folks who paid for them and had them looming over their lives, sometimes literally. Terraforming might be orders of magnitude more intense and protracted. Cultural and Philosophical Perspectives Different cultures and philosophical perspectives may view the idea of terraforming in varying ways, like our example with more men and mermaids from earlier. No matter what happens, you are building a new culture on a planet, indeed likely several, who will be shaped by that terraforming effort and who will likely have their main political and diplomatic tension points be about it too. Ruinous wars might be fought over how to bring life to a world and a side opposed to further terraforming might be willing to unleash terrifying weapons that would re-sterilize a planet. In the grander realm, back here on Earth, where the vast colonial arc ships will be built and launched from, some may see it as a human overreach or interference or interference with nature on a cosmic scale, while others may view it as a necessary step for human survival and expansion. And in the long term, these are projects that require people to stick to the plan for many generations, and it's very hard to see how you would maintain a clear consensus. Even a society that's cracked radical life extension, and thus might have its founding members still alive to see terraforming complete a hundred centuries later, we still have tons of new people being born and other people changing their minds. Who has authority on that planet to make these decisions and make them continue if public opinion shifts occasionally. In the end, terraforming involves complex ethical considerations across every aspect of human life, not to mention altering human life through bioforming, but spreads beyond that to every other organism we've encountered, terrestrial or alien. For my part, I am strongly in favor of terraforming, but not recklessly. I do not expect to find much intelligent life out there in the galaxy 
and I do not expect simple single-celled life to be particularly common either, so I suspect finding a planet with it will be such a wonderful novelty and scientific goldmine that people won't be anxious to change that planet. Nor are colonists surviving a new system out of luck if a planet turns out to have some simple life on it that probes missed. I favor space habitats for human expansion and regard the terraforming of an entire planet as a quest of thousands of years and a commitment to maintenance of it for millions of years to come. There's no need to rush into that. But ultimately, I feel humanity should embrace grand and noble purposes, and it's hard to think of many grander and nobler purposes than bringing life to a once dead world. Our conversation today was on ethics involving the advancement and usage of technology, and if you ever need any proof of how important that is to discuss in advance, the internet and artificial intelligence both stand as recent and glaring examples of how important that can be. We are bombarded constantly by people trying to steal and sell our data, and now artificial intelligence is involved in the game, harvesting your information and putting it out there for others to exploit. Just between 2021 and 2022, the number of victims of identity theft rose 41.5%. The good news is that you have the right to protect your privacy and request that data brokers delete the information they hold about you. The bad news is that it would take you years to do it manually, just once, and you need to repeat the process every few months as data brokers continue collecting your data and creating new records, using AI. But two can play that game, and that's where our sponsor, Incogni, comes in. They deploy AI to focus on finding your information online and send automated takedown requests for you. All you have to do is sign up, give them permission to act on your behalf to delete data, and then they go to work, and your data goes away. You can check up on the progress to see who had your data and how detailed and risky it was considered. Incogni makes these data harvesters take your info down, and they keep doing it too making sure that it stays down. Incogni is available risk-free for 30 days, so you can try it out and get a full refund if you aren't happy with the service. Use code IsaacArthur at the link in the episode description to get an exclusive 60% off an annual Incogni plan. Go to Incogni.com slash IsaacArthur and take your data back. So we were talking about terraforming today and many feel that the first planet we'll try that on is Mars. And next week we'll travel to Mars, not to look at the red planet, but instead at its two tiny moons, Phobos and Deimos, and ask why and how we could settle them. Then it'll be time for our Sci-Fi Sunday episode, Automated Justice, for a 50 minute deep dive on the role of AI in our courts and justice system. Then we'll return to the Fermi Paradox on March 21st to discuss the evolutionary jump from simple to complex, and if that might be the solution to the big question of where all the alien life is. Then we'll finish our discussion of last month on black holes by deep diving Kugelblitz black holes and using them for power generation, before finishing out the month with a bonus Sci-Fi Sunday episode on the 31st, Multi-Planetary Empires. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also help support the show on Patreon. And if you'd like to donate or help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content like Crystal Aliens at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur. As always, thanks for watching and have a great week.